Thank you, sir. Again, it is good to have you in the service tonight, and we're delighted that you're here. How many of you are here in the services this morning? And we are very, very glad you came back. Fantastic. How many of you are not here this morning? Okay, a few new people. We're glad you're here. How many of you are here this morning, but you just couldn't make it back tonight? <laughs> There's always a few people like that. Turn to somebody right beside you and say, it is so good to see you in church tonight. We're glad you're here. We really are. There is a series of books back in the book table. You need to read whether you're a kid or a teen or adult. Stop by the table after service, and my wife will introduce you to those. It's a medieval series. The whole thrust is to teach you to love the King of Kings, and I think you'll enjoy that series. Uh, visit our website if you want to, talesofcastles.net. There's learn more about it. But it's a series I think your family needs to read, okay? Uh, we're going to invite you, as Pastor did, to be here tomorrow night during the Bible school. Uh, we can use your help here, but also I think you'll benefit spiritually from some of the things that are presented. It'll be a good time, 6.30 to 8 o'clock each evening, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Gospel illusions, gospel magic, Bible games, games and prizes, a uh, minute to win it game. But best of all, perhaps, is Andy. People enjoy Andy and he'll be here every single night. So plan to be here. Bring some people with you if you would. Now tonight we have a very special treat. My wife, Miss Alma, is going to come and play and sing for you. And so you listen, please, as she comes for us.
And thank you, Elmo. I've had some people ask about my little friend Andy. He travels with me almost every place we go. And so I'll get him out just briefly for a moment or two and then move on to our message tonight if you'll bear with us here, okay? Thank you. If you're glad to be here tonight, say amen. Amen. Where are we? What? Where are we? Where do you think we are? I have no idea. Look around you. Look at all the smiling faces. Is that tell you anything? Yeah, I think we're at the zoo. <laughs> <laughs> we are at Valley Ford Baptist. You listen real closely. This is Andy. He's going to sing a song for us. And you listen to these things for us, okay? Go sit down. What? Go sit down. If I go sit down, what are you going to do? I'll sing the song. Go sit down. And I'll stay here and help you with the song, okay? Hold it, hold it. What's the matter? Who's that old man? What old man? The old geese in a red tie. <laughs> uh, Andy, this pastor, he's the pastor of this church. How old is he? That's none of your business. Looks like he's been in business for a long time. Pastor is not that old. He looks that old. Don't say that. He looks very cold. Don't say that either. <laughs> Andy, behave yourself. How old is he? I'm going to guess he's around 55, let's say. If he's around 55, it's the second time around. <laughs> Andy. <laughs> Pastor, can I ask you a question? Was you with Noah on the ark? <laughs> then how come he didn't drown? <laughs> Andy. <laughs> Leave Pastor alone. Sing your song, please. You listen, who's that lady sitting beside him? That's, that's Mrs. Pastor. He's the pastor's wife, okay? Can I talk to her? Maybe I'll ask Pastor uh, if you would, okay? Pastor, can I talk to her? Hi, lady. <laughs> What's your name? Jody. How old are you? Andy, Andy. <laughs> Andy, when you're talking to a lady, you don't ask her how old she is, okay? Uh, that's just something ladies don't talk about, okay? Why not? I have no idea why not, but just don't talk about ladies like that, okay? Talk about something else. Hi, lady. How much do you weigh? Andy, Andy. <laughs> Andy, perhaps you should talk to somebody else, okay? You listen, please, as Andy sings a song for us. Can I choose a volunteer? You can choose a volunteer. Uh, I don't see any volunteers. Then go sit down. I'll sing by myself. <laughs> You're going to sing by yourself. Uh-huh. I don't think so. I can handle it. Go sit down. Andy, come on. You thought something here hearing these sing? Yeah. Go sit down. Okay, we'll try something different. Andy's going to sing this song by himself. You listen, please, as he sings. Go for it. Now, we can wait all evening long, and Andy's not going to sing a thing. He can't. He's made of wood. He's made of cloth. He can't move. He can't talk. He can't sing. He can't laugh. He can't do anything unless I'm there to help him. Do you remember what Jesus told us in John 15, 5? Without me, you can do nothing. And folks, when it comes right down to it, you and I as believers are just as helpless as Andy, aren't we? Don't try to live the Christian life in your own strength. Don't try to fight temptation in your own power. Don't try to witness to others your own experience, your own wisdom. Jesus said in, Matthew, in John 15, if we abide in him, his strength becomes our strength. I can step close to Andy, give him a voice, he can do all sorts of things. What happened? Did I fall asleep? No, you didn't fall asleep, but uh, I'll get you out tomorrow night you sing this song, okay? Would you folks tell Andy goodbye, please? Goodbye. Andy, your turn, huh? Tell the folks goodbye. Well, where are they going? <laughs> <laughs> They're not going anywhere. You're the one that's going, huh? You have to get back in this suitcase. Again? Say goodbye, come on. I ain't going to go. You are going to go. Say goodbye. I ain't going to go. What do you think you can do? I'm going to sit in the sound booth with Matt. You're not going to sit up there with Matt. <laughs> and why not? It's just not a very good place for a dummy to sit. Then why is he sitting there? Andy, Andy, Andy. Let's go to a very special thing. I, we share with the young people, or want to share with the young people, we're talking about evolution tonight, how it never took place, and if one creature evolved to another, we'd have some creatures of half and half. And here's some, uh, well, some new creatures that may be in the process of evolving, okay? <laughs> cat catbird. You've seen catbirds before. Another catbird.
And of course, none of those are real, but that's what might have happened. I want to share something real quick, and we'll go into our message tonight. Um, sing with me, and then we'll go to the message. If we do it together. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing. I will sing. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness, thy faithfulness. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever I will sing. I will sing, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. Let me show you a really cool bike. This is a BMW R1150R, and just for the record, that runs circles around your Harley. I was getting down the freeway in Chattanooga where I live, just oh, four or five years ago, I guess. I'm coming down the on-ramp doing exactly 40 miles an hour, and my bike hit a patch of oil. You know what happened, don't you? Just like that, the bike is down. Just like that, I'm sliding across the pavement at 40 miles an hour. The pavement did $3,800 worth of damage to the bike. I wasn't wearing that leather that day. I was wearing a light break, windbreaker, a jacket from the aquarium. I was wearing a long sleeve shirt, blue jeans and tennis shoes. And the pavement shoot through the jacket and shirt. I mean, just holes everywhere. You know what happened to me? <laughs> I got a tiny scrape on my elbow, smaller than a dime. God protected me. You know how there's a triangle at the end of the on-ramp? You get to the triangle, and suddenly you're in the first lane. My bike stood all the way in that triangle, stopped probably 18 inches short of sliding in the first lane. I almost slid in the first lane as well, stopped just short of it. There was an 18-wheeler coming. If we'd been in that first lane, he couldn't have moved over. Heavy, heavy traffic. If he ran over the bike, he would have destroyed it instantly, wouldn't he? If he ran over me, what would have happened? He probably would have killed me instantly. And I have the assurance if that had happened, the very next moment I'd be in heaven with the Lord Jesus because I'm saved by grace, by Jesus Christ. If you're here tonight, you've never experienced that, never made that decision, can I take just a moment before our message and share with the Bible? Let's use the ABC again. A stands for the word admit. If you say it with me, admit that you are a sinner. Romans 3.23, a verse you know. Say it with me. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 23. What's the second word in the verse? And who is that? Would that include you? Would that include me? Would that include the preacher? Oh, yes. We may try to be good, try our very best, but we are sinners by nature. That's why we need a Savior. B stands for the word believe. Say it with me. Believe that Jesus died for you. The Lord Jesus Christ left heaven, went to earth, came to Calvary, willingly to die on the cross in your place, in my place, shedding his blood to pay for our sins because of his love for us. What happened three days, three nights later? He arose from the grave. He's alive tonight. I love the verse, Romans 5, 8. Say it with me, if you would, please, together. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5, 8. So again, the B, believe that Jesus died for you. C stands for the word call. Say it with me. Call on Jesus to save you. A very special promise in our Bible, Romans 10, 13, a promise from God himself. Say the promise with me. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10, 13. So again, if you're here tonight, you've never received Jesus as your Savior, it's as simple as ABC. A, admit to God that you're a sinner. The Bible says repent. Ask God to turn you from your sin. Ask for his forgiveness. B, believe that Jesus died and rose again, that he shed his blood on the cross for you. And C, call on Jesus to save you. He's promised he will save you. Salvation is that simple. Salvation is so simple, a little four-year-old boy can understand and receive the gospel. God made salvation that simple. Years ago, I witnessed to a man in our church. A man in our church had a friend that owned a number of motels, and he took me over and said, would you just share the gospel with him? And so I shared the gospel with this Roman, Roman Catholic man, this man who owned several motels. 
I finished the presentation of the gospel, and he said, you're saying that all I have to do is just ask Jesus to save me, and he forgives my sins? And that t I said, yes, sir. He said, sir, there has to be more to it than that. I said, no, sir. Jesus did the hard part. God made salvation so simple that a little four-year-old boy can understand and receive the Lord Jesus. And if you're here tonight, you've never received him, I'd encourage you to do that. Being saved is an incredible thing. It's a, it's a gift from God. Would you bow your head as we start our message tonight? Let's just go to the Lord in prayer tonight, asking God to speak to our hearts. Lord God, again, I thank you for the opportunity that's mine to stand before these folks and to share your word. Again, Lord God, I would ask that you'd fill me with your power and your spirit. Help me to share these principles, these concepts in a way that people understand and have their faith strengthened in the word of God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Tonight I want to address the question. Here's the question. How did it all begin? Where did this world come from? Where do we come from? And the Bible tells us in the very first verse. Read the verse with me. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That, of course, is Genesis 1-1. Our Bible tells us God made this earth in six literal 24-hour days. On day number one, the Bible tells us he made the earth, he made light, he made darkness. Day number two, he made the atmosphere, he made the oceans. Day number three, he made the dry land appear and all the plant life that grows on the, on, on the dry ground. Day number four, the sun, the moon, and the stars, quintillions of stars. Day number five, the birds and the fish. Day number six, the dry land animals. God looked at creation. The Bible says, behold, it was very good. But wait. He saved the very best for last. What was the final thing that God made on day six? He made man. He made a man, his name was Adam, made a woman, her name was Eve. And he placed him in a beautiful garden called the Garden of Eden. How do we know this is true? We find the Word of God, the Bible. Our God made this world. Several years ago, I went to the public library in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I checked out a book called From the Beginning, The Story of Human Evolution, written by a man named Mr. David Peters. Now, Mr. Peters is not a saved man. He doesn't know the Lord. He doesn't even have the beginning of wisdom. And he tells us a whole different story. He tells us this life, this world started. It was not designed by God. In fact, he makes fun of Christians in the book. He tells us that world started as a result of an explosion. Now, stop and think with me, folks. Do you build things with explosions? You destroy things with explosions. And here's the funny thing. He tells us there was a tiny dot, smaller than a period on the page. That little tiny dot exploded and created the universe. Would you believe that? Folks, you could not condense just the material in this building into a dot that small, let alone the entire universe. Then he tells us years later that there was another explosion, four and a half billion years later, and that created the solar system and our planet Earth. He tells us that uh, water vapor began to form and, and condense, and then there was some proteins and amino acids and kind of some sludge in a pond. And one day lightning struck the pond and started life. Now, does lightning start life? Usually, lightning will end your life. You stand in a cornfield, get struck by lightning, it'll not improve your health, it'll probably end your life, okay? That's not how you start life. And then he tells us that life started off on, on planet Earth as a simple one-celled organism. In a period of time, again, it grow and change and change and change. And Well, notice what he says. Read it with me. Together, humans and animals were not created individually, but share a common ancestry. He tells us to start off a one-celled organism and every period of time began to change and grow and become more complex. Uh, invertebrates became vertebrates. Fish became amphibians. Amphibians morphed and became reptiles. Reptiles became birds. Birds became mammals. Mammals became higher mammals called primates. And then the primates evolved and we find the final, final modern man. And that's known as the theory of evolution. Now, evolution cannot be proved by science. Creation cannot be proved by science. And you have to decide. Well, I believe evolution, this world made itself by accident. Well, I believe God, that God created this. Now, sadly, most of our universities, most of our schools, the National Park System, the Discovery Channel, all of these authoritative verses tell us we should believe evolution, we should reject, reject creation, because evolution is based on science. And folks, that's simply not true at all. I believe that a thinking person should embrace creation, reject evolution, because creation is supported by science. And I'll show you tonight just a, a few reasons why we say that. Here's a quote from a very famous scientist, Dr. Mary. He's known around the world. Notice what he says. Since Darwin, every knowing person agrees man descended from the apes. Today, there's no such thing as the theory of evolution. It is the fact of evolution. Do you see what he just said? He's telling us that science has proven evolution. And folks, that is not true at all. There is no scientific basis for evolution, whatever. There's no proof at all. And I'm sure this man is intelligent enough to know that he's not telling us the truth. He knows that he's lying. And here's what we want to do tonight. Let's put our two books side by side. Now, both these books cannot be right, can they? 
they tell two different stories. Now, telling two different stories, they could both be wrong, perhaps, but if they tell two different stories, both cannot be correct. You see, if my Bible is right, then this book is wrong. If this book is right, then my Bible is wrong. And let's just look at some simple reasons of science why we know our Bible is accurate, it's trustworthy, you can believe your Bible, okay? First of all, how old is planet Earth? Well, the Bible doesn't tell us, okay, planet Earth is so many thousand years old, but it tells us that Adam was created on day number six. Then it tells us how long Adam lived, how long the next guy lived, how long the next, the next guy lived. And if you put it all together and add it up, for according to our Bible, planet Earth is about 6,000 years old. Okay, how old? approximately 6,000 years old. The Bible tells us that 1,400 years later, 1,600 years later, rather, there was a worldwide flood. That worldwide flood would be about 4,400 years ago. Mr. Peters does not believe that. He tells us that planet Earth is 4 billion, 500 million, I need some more zeros here, excuse me, years old. Now again, we have two different stories. Both cannot be correct. If my Bible is right, this book is wrong. If this book is right, my Bible is wrong. So let's look and just see who's right and who's wrong. Uh, the Bible telling us approximately 6,000 years old. Mr. Peter's book telling us approximately 4.5 billion years old. Now they tell us that they can date the rocks and tell us how old the rocks are, how old the fossils are. And they use what we call circular reasoning. They'll tell us that this is pre in rock strata and it existed 520 million years ago. And you say, okay, how do we know that that rock strata is that old? They say, well, it's simple. We find trilobite fossils in the rock, and the trilobites. You say, okay, how do you know that the trilobites are that old? They say, well, it's simple. We find it in rock that is 520 million years old. <laughs> That's called circular reasoning. We date the rocks by the fossils. We date the fossils by the rocks, and everything's good. No, we're making up the numbers there. And they would tell us they have these dating methods that are scientific, radiometric dating. They dated the lava flows in Hawaii, told us they were nearly 3 billion years old. Problem was, we saw them form in 1801, a little over 200 years ago. Folks, they missed it by billions of years. They dated living mollusks and told us they were over 2,000 years old. No, they're still alive at the time. I'm saying this, the dating methods are not accurate at all. The Great Barrier Reef is the largest reef in the world off the northeast coast of Australia. As you probably know, a, a coral reef is an underwater mountain built of living creatures called corals. Here's a scuba diver down the Cayman Islands. That's my son, Steve. We were diving together, doing a crusade down there, and what an awesome place to dive. But the largest reef in the world, the oldest reef in the world, is off the northeast coast of Australia, known as the Great Barrier Reef. Scientists did a growth study for 20 years, measuring its growth and determining how old it was. When they finished, they looked at the data, and they were surprised. According to their research, the reef was only 4,200 years old. Not hundreds of thousands of years, they supposed. Why? I think I know. There's a worldwide flood about 4,400 years ago, and shortly afterwards, the Great Barrier Reef began to form. The rock strata. There, are no, there is no erosion between the layers of rock around this world. You go to the different mountain ranges, you see layers of rock, layers of rock, that's how the earth was formed, and yet there's no, there's no erosion between the strata at all. What does it tell a thinking person? If that layer was laid down, let's say this layer right here was laid down 500,000 years ago, and then another, you know, another layer is laid down 10,000 years later, you'd have 10,000 years of erosion, wouldn't you? That follows logically. There is no erosion between the layers at all. Why? Those layers were laid down rapidly within just a few days or even hours of each other during the worldwide flood. The dust on the moon. When I was in fifth grade in public in Christian school, man, Christian school. Our science textbooks told us that the dust on the moon might be more than a mile thick because the moon has no atmosphere. What happened in 1969? We land on the moon. And we discovered, we had discovered there's not a, a mile of dust on the moon. The dust on the moon was less than three quarters of an inch thick. Why? The moon is not four and a half billion years old. It's just a few thousand years old. The human population curve. Right now we have, we're approaching 7.6 billion people. But if you follow it backwards, it looks like life on planet Earth, human life, started about 4,000 years ago. Why just 4,000 years? I think I know. There was worldwide flood 4,400 years ago, and how many people walked off the ark alive? Eight people. And the human population started again. Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls is eroding. Moving water can actually cut solid rock. Niagara Falls is eroding back about five feet every year. Do the math. In 1,000 years, it'd be approximately one mile. Niagara Falls has eroded back about seven miles. Why not all the way back to Lake Erie? I think I know. The planet is not four and a half billion years old. It's just a few thousand years old, and that's why the erosion has only gone that far. You say, wait a minute, Mr. Ed. 
What about coal? Doesn't coal prove evolution? Here's a quote from my World Book Encyclopedia. Read it with me, if you would please, together. Coal developed from the remains of plants that died 400 million to 1 million years ago. Now, if my encyclopedia is right, my Bible is wrong. If my Bible is right, my encyclopedia is wrong. I believe my Bible. I believe there's an error in my encyclopedia. Let me show you one reason why. Here's an iron pot that was found in solid, sol inside a solid seam of coal. Now think with me. Who made the iron pot? Obviously a human being. If the iron pot was found inside the solid seam of coal, that tells me the pot was formed before the coal was formed. Do you follow me there? We have found tools, weapons, jewelry, coins, uh, all sorts of man-made objects inside solid seams of coal, which tell me that those human beings lived before the coal was formed. My encyclopedia is wrong. You say, wait a minute, Mr. Ed. What about the Grand Canyon? Didn't the Colorado River cut the Grand Canyon over millions and millions of years? How many of you were told that in school? I was. And I don't believe that. You know why? Well, several years ago, my brother Jeff and I hiked the Grand Canyon. And by the way, if you're a hiker, check out the Grand Canyon. It is an awesome hike. We're on the South uh, Kaibab Trail, getting ready to go down the trail into the canyon. Before we entered the canyon, we're standing on a plateau of 7,000 foot altitude. We look down to the east, and down 4,000 feet below that, the Colorado River flows in from the, from the east. Now, follow me here. If the Colorado River cut the Grand Canyon, it had to flow uphill about 4,000 feet to do so. Does water flow uphill? Not in my world. How did the Colorado River cut the Grand Canyon? It didn't. The Colorado River did not cut the Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon was formed just a short while during the worldwide flood. You say, wait a minute, Mr. Ed, what about the dinosaurs? Did not the dinosaurs die out 65 million years ago? Aren't the dinosaurs proof that our Bible is wrong and the evolution is right? Not at all. Not at all. There was a find two years ago in Hell Creek, Montana. We found a T-Rex. They told us that T-Rex was 68 million years old. But then as they're studying the fossil, they began to find a lot of soft tissues inside the fossils. And rather than back up and say, whoops, we made a mistake, they said, well, uh, maybe soft tissues last longer than we think they do. No, that dinosaur is not 68 million years old. We have found models of dinosaurs that made hundreds and hundreds of years ago. How do these people know what dinosaurs look like? Folks, I believe that dinosaurs and human beings lived at the same time. They lived together. And back in those days, they didn't call them dinosaurs. What did they call them? Dragons. You go anywhere around this world and go to the old people groups and you will find legends of, of dragons again and again and again all around this world. People and dinosaurs lived at the same time. They didn't date about 68 million years ago. You say, wait a minute, Mr. Ed, what about the caves? I went to a cave. They said, don't touch the stalactites. It takes 100 years to grow an inch. Don't touch the stalagmites. It takes 100 years to grow an inch. I've been in a lot of different caves. Sometimes they'll tell you 100 years for an inch. Sometimes they say 250. Sometimes they say 1,000. Choose your own number, Okay. Let's say 250 for one inch, okay? If it takes 250 years to grow one inch, how long would it take to grow a foot? 3,000 years. Now, here's what's called a column. A stalactite has grown from the ceiling. A stalagmite grew from the floor, and they joined in the middle. Now, here's a six-foot man with a jumpsuit, and you can see his, his blue helmet there. If it takes 3,000 years to grow one foot, that's a lot more than 6,000 years of history, isn't it? Folks, they don't grow that slowly. I was canoeing in Michigan. I brought a canoe from man in the church. I'm paddling downstream, passed under a concrete bridge. As I'm passing under the concrete bridge, I looked up and said, whoa, and I started backpedaling. There were stalactites growing on the bottom of that, cave, uh, bottom of that bridge. They were 8 and 9 and 10 and 12 inches long. I'm back, back, back paddling, look at this. I said, this is amazing. I did the math real fast. I said, this concrete bridge, apparently, was built several hundred years before Columbus discovered America. <laughs> no, they don't grow that slowly, folks. There's a man in Alabama who has a commercial cave. He's a believer. He has his own cave. He put little plexiglass guards in front of stalactites and stalagmites and measured them. In his cave, they grow approximately an inch and a quarter every year. If somebody tells you 100 years for an inch, 250 years for an inch, 1,000 years for an inch, they either do not know what they're talking about or they're deliberately lying to us. The cave, the, the lactites grow a lot faster than that. I'm saying this, your Bible is accurate. Your Bible is true. Planet Earth is about 6,000 years old. You can trust your Bible. Read some verses with me, if you would, together. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. 
All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Do you know the name of your creator? His name is Jesus. Jesus, your Savior, is also your creator. Now, here's a question I want to go to briefly, and here's a question that evolutionists don't want to answer. They don't want to discuss this. They don't want to talk with you. Here's the question. Say it with me. Where are the transitional forms? Say it again. Where are the transitional forms? One more time. Where are the transitional forms? How many know what a transitional form is? If evolution did take place, if one creature evolved to another, there ought to be a record of the change, okay? Let's say that fish involved in amphibians. If fish evolved in amphibians, there'd be some creatures that are alive today that are half fish and half amphibian. If fish involved in amphibians, there ought to be some creatures in the fossil record that are half fish and half amphibian. Let's say that reptiles evolved into birds. There'd be some creatures that are half bird and half reptile in the fossil record and alive today. Let's say that uh, birds evolved into mammals. What would that look like? Well... It's called a bird dog, folks. <laughs> You've seen bird dogs before. We're being facetious here, but it didn't take place. If mam mammals evolved into higher mammals, we would have some creatures that are half ma mammal and half higher mammal, half primate. If plants, if grass is evolved into trees, there'd be some plants today that are half and half. There'd be some plants in the fossil record that are half and half as they made the, creature, as they made the change, okay? Now, we have found billions and billions and billions of fossils. I didn't say millions. I said billions. Does anybody know how many transitional form fossils have we found so far? There are none. What's the tell a thinking person? Folks, evolution never took place. There's no record of it in the, in the fossil record. There's none of these creatures alive today. There is no scientific evidence for, for evolution at all. Years ago, a man wrote a book, published a book. Notice what he said. As by this theory innumerable transitional forms must have existed. Why do we not find them embedded in the crust of the earth? Why is all nature not in confusion instead of being as we see them, well-defined species? Do you understand what he's saying? And this man is an evolutionist. He's saying there is a problem. We don't have any transitional forms. Now, the man, of course, was Charles Darwin. He published his book in 1859. A few paragraphs later in the same book, and I should have copied it down, he said, in the next few years, we're going to find a multitude of transitional forms, and that will prove my theory. Now, since 1859, we've been looking for them. How many have we found? There are none. There never will be. Why? Evolution never took place. It's impossible. There's no scientific proof at all. Here's another transitional form. Half dog, half cat. What would you call that? A dat. Okay. How about this one here? A cross between a dog and a shark. What would you call that? A dark. Are you afraid of the dark? How about this one here? Rhino Roo. <laughs> now here's my fav personal favorite, T Rex the Pillar. <laughs> Next time you go in the garden and pick some tomatoes for your mom, be very careful. These little guys hide under, the, hide under the leaves. You reach for a tomato, they'll take off a finger just like that. I mean, they're pretty vicious, okay? You want a, a pet that the natives will notice? How about a duck offent? That would be a nice one, okay? We're being facetious here, but I'm saying this transitional forms are not in existence, not a single one. Evolution never took place. Stephen Gould well-known around the world. Notice this. Notice what he said. The absence of fossil evidence for intermediate stages between major transitions in organic design has been a persistent and nagging problem for gradualistic accounts of evolution. What's he saying? I believe in evolution, but there's simply no proof. But I'll believe it anyway. Zero transitional forms. And scientists after scientists after scientists have admitted there's no evolution, uh, no, no scientific basis for evolution at all. Again, Dr. Mayer, he's saying it's not the theory of evolution, it is the fact of evolution. He has to know that he's lying. And scientist after scientist after scientist have told us there's no proof. So here's what it's coming down to. You can't prove evolution by science. You can't prove creation by science. You simply have to decide, will I believe God or will I believe Darwin? Transitional forms, you say, what do they do if they don't have them? They make them up. You ever heard of Arcturopteryx? I have a hard time saying it. We found seven of these creatures in the land of Germany. They tell us this was a reptile evolving into a bird. But if we studied it further, there's no reptilian features at all. It was simply a bird that had teeth. Reptiles have very dense, very, very heavy bones. Uh, uh, birds have very light hollow bones. How many know what a frigate bird is? Anybody? A frigate bird is a huge bird that has a seven-foot wingspan. The entire skeleton weighs less than four 
ounces. Reptiles are cold-blooded. Birds are warm-blooded. One man I was reading, I remember it's in Mr. Peter's book, another book, he tells us how the birds form feathers. He says, one day a reptile was running through the forest and ran into a thorn bush. The thorn bush shredded his four limbs and he ran away with his skin just in shreds and the, skin, the shredded skin became feathers. <laughs> if you believe that, I'll make you some sales after church. I'll some things I need to sell you, okay? What about the coelacanth? The coelacanth was a large fish, about five feet long, weighed almost 100 pounds. You can't see it, but in this, in this fossil picture here, but the fins are little lobes, almost like little legs. The evolutionists told us, told us the coelacanth died out 35 million years ago, but it was evolving into a reptile or into an amphibian. It was a fish that didn't, it didn't f swim through the water. It actually crawled on the bottom, but it died out 35 million years ago. Well, guess what happened in 1938? We found that the coelacanth is still very much alive. It doesn't walk on the bottom. It swims the way God designed it 6,000 years ago. You say, wait a minute, Mr. Ed. I went to the museum. I saw missing links. I saw transitional forms. What you saw were plastic models that somebody made. You saw pictures that somebody drew. Folks, they weren't real. You ever hear of Nebraska man? In 1925, Harold Crook went to Snake River, Nebraska. He found a creature he told us was 500,000 years old. He was a primate evolving into modern man. He told us how tall this guy was, how strong he was, what kind of tools he used, what kind of weapons he used, what his favorite diet was. And most people assumed that Mr. Cook had found a, a complete skeleton. You know what he found? He found one tooth. It was not a primate tooth. It was not a human's tooth. It was a tooth of an extinct pig. And he built his entire creature, Nebraska man, around that one tooth. Folks, that's called lying. You ever hear of Piltdown Man? Piltdown, England? A scientist over there wanted to prove evolution. He took the jawbone of a, of a primate, took the skull of a human being. He filed them down where they fit together fairly closely, like they belong together. He put a chemical on called potassium chromate, which makes things look old. He buried them in a gravel pit for several months, just left them there. One day at the university, he called some of the students and said, hey guys, let's go on a fossil dig. This was a good place. They dug up Piltdown Man. And for 45 years, it was used in the textbooks as proof of evolution. Now please hear me. When Piltdown Man was discovered there were believers that had their faith shaken by that they said wait a minute if science has proved that this is one of our ancestors my bible is no longer true folks the entire thing was a hoax it was a fraud it was a lie it was not real at all same thing with the Neanderthal man you ever hear of Lucy you say wait a minute Mr. Ed what about Lucy Australopithecus Africanus what about Lucy Donald Johansson went to Haydar Valley Ethiopia in 1974 he found a creature about three feet tall. He told us was three million years old. He called it Lucy. In fact, in his book, he gives us a picture of what he thinks Lucy looked like. And then he has some pictures in his book. Here is the modern, here's the human being, uh, the human knee joint, the upper bone, I believe, is called the femur. And look at the, the human femur. Is it angled or straight? Which is it? Okay, so it's angled. Here is the modern primate. Look at the femur, angled or straight? Okay, so the femur on the primate is straight. The femur on the angle on the human being is angled. Here's Lucy's knee joint. Look at the femur, angled or straight? Okay, angled. So he said, okay, the, the modern primate is, is straight. The human being is angled. The femur on, the, on Lucy is angled. And so Lucy is evolving into human being. And people around the world believed him and thought this was proof of evolution. Can I tell you the rest of the story? In 1974, he went to Hadar Valley, Ethiopia, found the, found the skeleton. He went back to Hadar Valley, Ethiopia a year later, approximately a mile and a quarter from where he found the skeleton, a mile and a quarter away, he found the knee joint. Can you legitimately put those two together and tell me they belong together? Yes or no? The whole thing was a fraud. There's one more picture they did not include. Many modern primates that are alive today have angle femurs just like Lucy. Lucy was not evolving. Lucy was not three million years old. Lucy was simply a primate that was lied about to use the proof of evolution. I'm saying this. This book is wrong. Your Bible is right. You can trust the Word of God. Young people, when you go to college, you could go to a secular college, a professor's going to stand up. He's very articulate. He's very intelligent. He's a sharp guy. He's got a lot of education. He's going to tell you that your Bible is not, not true. You can't trust your Bible. Don't believe that man. You're being lied to. I'm saying this, your Bible is true. God made this world. And there's a lot of indications of science that is correct.
Let me finish one quick story, and we're out of time here. How many know what a monarch butterfly is? Here's something I learned just a few months ago. I think this is fascinating. Modern butterfly, modern butterfly lays her eggs, and then she goes off, she dies. Two weeks later, what hatches out? An eating machine called a caterpillar. <laughs> he, what it does when he comes out, he just eats and eats and eats. He doubles his weight the very first day. He doubles his weight again the second day and the third day and the fourth day. He just sits there and eats and eats and eats. And he keeps doubling his weight, doubling his weight. If a human baby did that, your baby would weigh over a ton in less than three weeks. <laughs> Finally, he forms what's called a chrysalis. He forms about two, spends about two weeks inside the chrysalis. Halfway through the process, if you rip, rip the chrysalis open, you know what you find? Soup. Just a gooey, sticky substance. The, the caterpillar's gone. and just, just this goop. But a week later, what hatches out? A beautiful, beautiful monarch butterfly. And here's something I learned just a few months ago, and I think this is awesome. There are four generations of butterflies, of monarch butterflies every year. The first generation hatches out in March. They live two to six weeks. They lay their eggs, and then they die. The second generation hatches out in May. They live two to six weeks. They lay their eggs. They die. The third generation hatches out in July. They live two to six weeks. They lay their eggs. They die. The fourth generation hatches out in September. And for some reason, they live six to eight months. Why so much longer? Well, that gives that little butterfly the time to migrate to Mexico. And in the fall, that butterfly will fly a thousand, thousand of miles, go down to Mexico. By the way, the butterfly's brain lays less, less than one five thousandth of an ounce. She's going to make a trip of two or three thousand miles. How does she do that? God daughter. She goes to Mexico, spends the winter in Mexico. At the end of the winter, she comes back and flies back to the very same place where she hatched out. How does she do that? She doesn't have GPS. But God designed. Now, here's what an evolutionist says. Mother Nature sure has some cool ways of doing things, doesn't she? No, it's not Mother Nature. It's your creator, the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's something else I learned recently. There are more than 20,000 species of butterflies. Why 20,000? Because six or eight species of butterflies do the job of pollination? Sure. Why 20,000? God made the extra butterflies just for you to enjoy. By the way, if you think this world is beautiful, wait till you see the new world that's going to be formed. Your, the kingdom is going to be beautiful. I'm saying this tonight. Your Bible is true. You can trust it. When a scientist tells me I've got proof of evolution, no, there is no proof. Evolution never took place. Your Savior is also your creator. Would you bow your heads for just a moment? I'm going to ask Pastor to come and take our service. Let me say this. If you're here tonight, you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior. I would encourage you to come tonight. Let somebody show you how to put your faith in Him. Trust Him for your salvation. He's a wonderful Creator. He's a wonderful Savior. And we can trust Him. Pastor. Let's pray together. Father, tonight we are in awe of such a wonderful Creator God. Whether we look through the microscope or the telescope, we see intelligent design. And yet by faith, we believe the Bible is true. And yet the evidence strengthens our faith. And thank you for the evidence that we've seen tonight, which truly is the tip of the iceberg. Father, I pray that we can be ready to give an answer to every man that asks the hope that we have in our heart of our faith in Christ and our faith in the Word of God. Whether it's through archaeology, whether it's through science, Bible prophecy, the unity that we have, our own testimony We know the truth. And the truth sets us free, free from lies, free from darkness, uh, free from hate, and free to know you and love you. And Father, we thank you that our Savior came into the world to show us what God is like. And I pray that we will have the faith of a child to believe, to follow, to obey. I pray tonight that each one of us will love what you love, will hate what you hate, will care about those things that you care about. And you've told us that you love the world, the people of the world. And now, Father, I pray that that love that you have for us would be in us that we will love others, will show patience and kindness, will share truth, 
We'll speak the truth in love. I pray that as the week before us, we'll have opportunities of, of challenge, of stress, of disobedient children. I pray that the Spirit of God will bring the best out of us, and that best would be you and not us, that we can show your love to children, to teenagers, to parents. So tonight I ask that you might uh, prepare our hearts to put sin out of our life, to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, to truly put to death the sin and selfishness that would hinder the working of God in our hearts and lives. And so, Father, as we have this invitation time, uh, may our hearts be, be tender to your working in us, that you'll be the potter, we'll be the clay, and just as you created this world, you are recreating us to become Christ-like. Bless now our invitation, I ask in Jesus' name, amen. May we stand together as we sing the song of invitation tonight. My Jesus, I love thee. My Jesus, I love thee. May we sing it because he loved us first. And so we love him back. So may we sing it tonight and now show our love to Christ by how we treat one another and how we will treat the lost world that comes to us this week as we sing. My 